and uh, and as well, and maybe I'll just go into this this one here first. Um, my wife was sharing with me how that in one of the books that she's reading, uh, just, you know, trying to really unravel some of the teachings that are in Judaism, uh, there was one that she brought to my attention, and I actually did not know this, uh, as far as the reason why women light the candles on Shabbat. Why is this? Ha why does this happen? What is the 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 reasoning behind women lighting the candles on Shabbat? So I brought up two different articles for you, one here on Chabad.org, and also one here on uh, uh, MyJewishLearning.com, and both of them are citing uh, the, the, the sources for this. Uh, now, they're not saying where it actually is written at. I think my wife, when she discovered it, discovered it as far as under the either uh, the, the Talmudic teachings, uh, etc., where a lot of this comes from. But let me just give you, for example, MyJewishLearning.com. Uh, returning the light is the part of this right here that I'm going to read for you. Some sources characterize women's candle lighting as a uh, uh, recertification of uh, tikkun, in other words, for Eve's sin, uh, uh, recertification, I should say. For Eve sin, just as the biblical figure diminished the light of the world through her sin in the Garden of Eden, women can return light to the world through lighting Shabbat candles. But there is another way to view candle lighting. Those looking at candle lighting as a reward can turn to Kabbalistic sources that view women as the bearers of life and the light to the world. Now, I mean, that one just blows me away when they look at this here. You know, it's almost like they're saying, the women have to light the candles on Shabbat in order to kind of like, um, almost like paying for the crime of Eve. But you have to understand, Eve did not sin alone. In fact, the scripture tells us that Eve was deceived, right? And Adam, knowing what he was doing, he willfully sinned, and this is what plunged the humanity into, into sin to begin with. And it didn't, it didn't uh, uh, extinguish the light either, but it blocked the access of redemption to the tree of life, which is where the light is. It blocked the access to that tree of life until redemption could come. So for my Jewish brothers and sisters, though, that you have this Kabbalistic source that view women as the bearers of life, let me say to you this here, although I do not believe in Kabbalah whatsoever, uh, I will tell you this, seeing as you're using that as that source there, that women's are the bearers of life, that light itself would be brought back by a woman. I will agree with that. But it's not from lighting candles on Shabbat. So if you're lighting the candles on the Shabbat, let me just share this with you. Although it seems like a beautiful tradition, we used to do it. I have to admit, we used to do it as well right? But the problem is, is you're saying that Eve sinned and she extinguished the light and therefore the women as they light those candles and they say the prayer there for it, you're basically saying this is the way to restore that light to the world. This is one of the actions that we need to do as, a, as Jewish women to bring back the light. No, 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 no. You have to understand, what did Eve do wrong herself? See, Adam sinned willfully and it caused the human race to die. So in the case of Adam, God would have to have a man that would take Adam's place and would believe God's word and would restore life back through death. See, Adam knew that he was going to plunge the human race into death, but Adam could not redeem the human race. And it took a, took a man that could redeem the human race by death. All right? But in the case of Eve, she was deceived. She was tricked into something. She, you could say Eve doubted because Satan was manipulating God's word and it caused her to, to question it for a moment. Instead of questioning the word of God, God wanted her to believe the word of God. And if she had believed the word of God, we wouldn't have had the fall. Now, not like the Kabbalists and the Talmudists today that say that the serpent, when he come to Eve, he liberated Adam and Eve and got them out of the paradise so that they could be human. Oh, 
my gosh. See, Kabbalists also say that the, that the numeric vowel, uh, value, the gematria of Nachash, the serpent, and Mashiach are 358, and so therefore they're equal to one another. Nonsense! What a bunch of garbage that is. Jeez. All right, let me share some beautiful things with you, though. I, I want to, this is something I got to share. Let me, let me go to Chabad.org. Why is woman's role to light the Shabbat candles? Our sages have declared that the privilege of lighting the Shabbat candles belongs to the woman because she is usually more involved in running of the house and spends more time at home. Eve, by persuading her husband to eat of the tree of knowledge, brought death to the world and extinguished the candle of God. To atone for this, women kindle the Shabbat candles, reigniting the God spark. I told you they said they believe it's atonement. So you might find this a beautiful ritual, but if you're following with the tradition of Judaism and lighting the candles as a woman on Shabbat, in the, in the uh, every Shabbat evening, you are trying to atone for the sin of Eve. And that's not how you atone. All right? Mary actually atoned for the mistake that was made by Eve. And what did Mary do? In fact, it's interesting. Sarah should have been the one that atoned for it. Remember when the angels come down, the three of them, but the one that stays with Abraham is yod heh vav -Hey, Yehovah, right? And that's not even the correct way to say his name. You guys know my argument on that. I won't go into that right now, but you know what I'm talking about. So I'll just say Yehovah for the, for the sake of argument, right? Yehuah, whichever way you want to say it, Yahuwah, whatever you want to say, that's fine with me. But when it comes to him, when he came on this earth, and he came there to Abraham, and he was a man. He was able to eat, right? Right along with the others. And he's the one that says to Abraham, I will visit you according to the time of life, and you will bear a son. Now, I forget how old Abraham is at the time. I mean, he's like getting close to 100 years old. You're going to bear a son. This time next year, you'll have a son. And, of course, Sarah, way past the time for having children. Now, she should have believed because, see, God said that, his, that he was going to bring the promised seed through Abraham. Now, that promised seed is Mashiach. That's the only reason there is going to be a chosen race. And, of course, Jacob, through his 12 sons, and even his 12 sons, that has nothing to do with anything. Because look at Jacob. Look at all the children of Israel. Not Jacob himself, but all of his descendants, all the evil they do, all the idolatry they get into, the children of Israel all the way down, the house of Israel, all the idolatry they got into. The prophets constantly calling them out for idolatry and sins. And finally, God divorces the house of Israel. And before you know it, the house of Judah is also in exile because of idolatry and sin that is just unbelievable. Yeah, they look like the religious people offering sacrifices and kept right up with the temple services like it's no big deal all the way up to the time of Yeshua and seven years after he left. But the idolatry that they were involved in was unbelievable. Never stopped, right? That's what sent Israel into exile, including the house of Judah. All right? Not to mention killing their Messiah, which, of course, Jews believe there's two Messiahs, Ben Yosef and Ben David. Ben Yosef is, to, is going to die in battle, but he's going to restore uh, the word of God back to the Jews. Hmm. Well, if you believe that Ben Yosef is going to die, what was the problem with Yeshua when he came and died? What was wrong with Yeshua when he read Isaiah 61, Yeshayahu, and he read 60, chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, out of Beth, but he cut it off in the half of Beth right there, halfway to Vechatsi, he cut it off, and he said, he closed the scroll, he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing. He knew that he was going to die. He said it over and over and over and over. But he also said he would return. So if you want to say it's Ben Yosef and Ben David, then he was Ben Yosef back then, and he's coming back as Ben David. All right? So why, why do you sit there then and blame the Christians when you try to sit there like with Tobia Singer? You know, Tobia, we've communicated back and forth, you know. 
I appreciate Tovia for his honesty. I'll say that. But when you want to know what Tovia thinks about Christians, he believes you're a bunch of idolaters. Except for those of you that, you know, you just think that Jesus is a prophet. If you believe like that, no problem. All right? Tovia, though, is just like a Pharisee of 2,000 years ago, and Tovia's not afraid to say that. He admits that. Tovia thinks that the Pharisees were good people. I believe there were Hasmoneans that, that usurped the authority of the priesthood and drove the Zadok, the Zadok priesthood completely out of Israel, and they were the ones that were living down in Qumran. And no, the ones in Qumran did not believe the same way as the ones that, that lived there in, uh, uh, up there in Jerusalem. That's too obvious by the very documents that are found at Qumran, at least the ones they allow us to see, right? Now, so the point is, though, let's get back to this part about redemption. I get sidetracked on everything. When we're looking at this part about redemption, what's really fascinating here, though, like I said, they're trying to make it look like these women have to atone by lighting the candles. No. So what was it? Sarah doubted in her heart or laughed inside of herself. And let me tell you something. Not only Sarah laughed, Abraham laughed about it as well. So we can't just blame Sarah, we got to blame Abraham as well. That's, what, that's the whole point. Sarah and Abraham were just like Adam and Eve. Adam messed up, so did Eve mess up. Abraham messed up, laughed, and said, how can this be? In fact, God has him name his son Yitzhak. He laughs. Because he considered the word of God to be a joke. When God tells you something, take his word for it. I don't care how, much, how silly it might sound to you. Don't laugh about it. You just need to believe it. Sarah laughed too and said, how can this be? I, me being old, have pleasure with my Lord again. You know, she laughed as well. Had she believed the word of God, had she done like Mary did, which by the way, I have to really thank my wife for the research she does there. She just discovered recently when we speak about Isaiah 9, 6, I believe it is, where it says a woman, uh, behold, a, a virgin shall conceive and she shall be with a child. Right? Remember that scripture right there? And of course, Tovia Singer has, has beat up more Christians, and I fell for it as well, because in the Masoretic text, we have Alma, a young woman. My wife found that where Irenaeus, the, uh, one of the early church fathers, had charged the Jewish community for taking out the word virgin and putting in the word Alma. No wonder why Jesus not only charged the Pharisees, but also the scribes as well. The very ones that were copying down Torah, he charged them as well as he did the Pharisees and Sadducees. So it was a virgin that conceived, and they took the word out. I'll have to get that document and share that with you. Next time we're on me and Jan, I'll try to remember to do that so you can see that. All right, so the point is, what happens? Mary comes up, and Mary, when, when the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, Behold, you will, you, you will be with a child. First, she just says, uh, uh, you know, let me, let me just pull that up real quick. Let's pull it up. Let's go to Matthew. It's probably the, them getting, uh, going to have a child. All right, yeah, so it's definitely Luke is where we're looking at here. All right. And in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espouse uh, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed are, are thou among women. And when, he, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall... Uh, this be, seeing I know not a man. Now, see, she's not questioning. She's just trying to find out how's it going to be about. Not like in the case of Sarah, where Sarah just laughs about it, right? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also thou 
that that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth she, uh, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You see, Mary fixed what happened with Eve. Eve doubted will say the word of God. And so Satan therefore got one over on her. And yes, that light of the world, which was Christ in them, as it even says in Genesis, right? We know in Genesis that they were called Ish and Isha. We'll get into that in just a moment in chapter two. But let me just, let's go back to the part where the light is. All right, so we have Bereshit Baralahim et Hashemayim ve et Haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Ve Haaretz hayatat tohu ve vohu ve choshek apane tachum. Right now, the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face uh, of the deep. Right? Ve ruach Elohim merachavet apane hamayim ve yomer Elohim yahiyod ve yahiyod. Right? And it says there, and, and God hovered over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, just the fact that it says in here that he, that he hovered, see, see, Beruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, Merachafet al Penehamayim, it's like God walked on the water. Now, notice, he walked on the water, but what was it when he was walking on the water? Before the light even comes, Vehoshik Apanetachum, all right, there was there was darkness upon the face of the deep. When did Yeshua himself walk to his apostles when they were in the ship? And he walked on the water of the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret. He walked at night when there was darkness over the water. You know, let me tell you something. My friends out there that are that are perplexed about who Yeshua really is. When we sit there and my wife asked the other day, you know, how many of you believe that Yeshua is God? He is God manifested in a human body. And many people began to say to her, I mean, a lot of the people said, yes, we believe, we believe, we believe. But then there was a handful of people that were actually saying, no, you can't worship Yeshua. That's wrong. Well, that's the Noahide group. That's the side that will actually end up taking the Noahide laws, and you don't have any fear at all about idolatry. But let me tell you something. Everything about Yeshua proved who he was. You know, now notice it says right there, The Spirit of God. Walked over the face of the dark, uh, while it was darkness, he walked over the face of the deep, right? Now think about that for a moment, because Yeshua said, I'll not leave you comfortless, but I will be with you, even in you, until the consummation. So when you look at the, the Holy Spirit, when we look at the Son of God, when we look at the Heavenly Father, it says in the Scripture, these three are one. You understand? When he would sit there and, and when 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 the uh Yehovah comes down to Moses and he's in front and we see where he speaks about the angel of the Lord. Now the angel of the Lord is not Yehovah, the angel of the Lord is only the form in which God was declaring himself to Moses, which was the pillar of fire. And from the midst of that bush, it says that Yehovah spoke to Moses. All right? And when Yeshua was on the cross, he was in the midst of the thorn bush, once again, speaking to the children of Israel. When Yeshua took the blind man and took, and he spit on the ground and he made clay, and he put it on the eyes of the blind man, and he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. It wasn't that the pool of Siloam had some kind of holy water in it. He was showing you that he was the same God that formed the man from the dust of the earth and could take clay and spit on it again and form eyes into the sockets of that man. Didn't think about those, did we? See, everywhere you turn, 
everything he did. When he breathed on his apostles after his res resurrection, he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <sighs> he was showing that he was the same God that said, uh, Nishmat, uh, wait a minute, let me just, we got the part that he's light right here, so let's just quickly, let's look at that real fast. In, in chapter 2, right? There it is right there. He breathes into the nostrils of Adam, the chayim, that life, the very life of Almighty God. So when Yeshua says, I'll be with you, even in you, into the consummation, that's that life. That's his life. He restored the life. In fact, Mary corrected the mistake that Eve made and Yeshua corrected the mistake that Adam made. You see, Adam went into the dust of the earth, but he had no way to raise himself back up. Yeshua had the ability to lay his life down and raise it back up again. And he says, no man can take my life. He said, I lay my life down willingly and I raise it up. That's a personal pronoun. So, do you need to light the Shabbat candles in order to bring about redemption for what Eve did? No, you don't. But I'll give them credit for one thing on my Jewish learning when they said the Kabbalists were saying that the women do bring the light to the world when they produce a baby. Yes. But it wasn't because you produce a baby. It was because of one Jewish woman that produced a child that brought the light of the world back in. And she's the one that corrected that mistake. No need of lighting candles. That's what brought that life back in. You know, and listen, as I tell you these things, and I don't want to get too deep into this, as I share this with you, this is what came on my heart as well. And I'll tell you something. Oh, by the way, too. That's another interesting thing. I forgot to bring this up in the news there. They had beautiful Arab Christians celebrate Palm Sunday near Nazareth and wave Israeli flags. Yeah, notice if you have to look at this video, it's really interesting. They wave Israeli flags, right? Well, they have an Israeli flag there, but I don't know how well you can see this right here, and the Vatican flag. Why do they have both flags together? Because Rome and Israel have made their marriage. I just thought I'd throw that in there. All right, now, let's get to this something very interesting here. Now, <laughs> a couple of things I want to share with you right now. Here's another one here. These things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. You know what's interesting? I noticed that uh, it was uh, Mark Biltz that made that statement recently. He said that, and not just Mark Biltz, there's others that say this as well. No, I take it back. I don't think it was Mark Biltz. Let me just correct myself on that. Um, it is, it is r rabbis that are saying this, that the one people that have a difficult time accepting the Noahide laws are Hebrew roots and Messianic believers. Right? Hebrews and Messianic believers. Now, now Dr. Pigeon says that Mark Biltz used to always have the, uh, the prayer shawl and everything else inside of his uh, church there. But those things have long been removed. Makes you wonder why, right? But at any rate, when I read this, and I was trying to find this for the longest time, couldn't remember where it was at. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And that's what they're going to do when they use this capital punishment to bring about the idolatry law in the Noahide laws. That anyone that worships Jesus Christ, believes him to be divine, they'll think by killing you, that they do God a service. Interesting. Anyway, that wasn't what I wanted to share with you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the two witnesses. I ran across this new scripture, and it's kind of very timely, because there's a very precious sister uh, that listens to a lot of our broadcasts, uh, and uh, she had just mentioned to me, in fact, it was kind of a little bit of a surprise to me, but she had mentioned to me in a private message that Elijah had already come the two times, it had only spoke of him coming two times, and he wouldn't come back 
uh, again, there was, or there was no need for him to return again. Because to me in Scripture, when we look at Revelation, uh, uh, I believe it's Revelation, is it chapter 11, I think is right? Um, we have the Scripture speaking about the two witnesses, and uh, many, many uh, script, uh, believers have always believed this to be Moses and Elijah because of the gifts that are displayed in there. And of course, their dead bodies, the two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. Right. But we do know that they're killed. Their, their dead bodies will lay in the great city that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Verse eight which is the modern-day Jerusalem, uh, and it has become Sodom and Egypt because of Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, but they also identify it where our Lord was crucified, speaking of Yeshua. And so, you know, and of course, I have always believed that this being Moses and Elijah. And the Lord had just revealed to me something about Elijah, not so much revealing, but I saw it in the Hebrew Matthew, and then I went to study this also in the Greek text as well, because uh, it was just a true confirmation. Because I've always argued this. This is right after uh, they come down, the apostles are coming down with Yeshua from Mount Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah had just appeared to him, right? And uh, as they came down the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Or Elijah, right? And Jesus answered, right? Answered them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, to me, that is future tense. No matter how you get around it, that's future tense. But then he says, But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Now, John the Baptist is dead. But this first come and restore all things, John the Baptist was not one to restore all things. Yeshua was restoring all things. Now, I've always held this view on this, right? And then I went into the um, Greek language to look at this, and I wanted to share this with you. And, of course, we're in Matthew 17, 11, right? Let me blow this up as big as I can for you guys so you can really see this as well with me. All right, now... As we go in here, it says, The yet Jesus, or Yeshua, answering said to them, Elias, or Elijah, indeed, okay, indeed, is coming before most and shall be restoring all. All right? Now, Here's where the key is in here. Even when you got the is coming, this is really interesting. Is coming is from present tense, middle voice, and past tense, which kind of shows that he had come and he died, and presently he's speaking of him coming again. But it's the shall be restoring all things is where you see in the Greek exactly what's going on because it's future tense. And it's active in a third person singular. All right? I think that's what 3 uh, SG is standing for, third person singular. So the shall be restoring is future tense in Greek. Okay? But what really blew me away is that in the Hebrew Matthew, and those of you that want to read the Hebrew Matthew, all you have to do is go to Adamo, A D A M O H dot org, Tree of Life. That's just part of the thing there. But at adamo.org is where you see the Hebrew Matthew online. You can see the whole thing for yourself. Now, I'm going to blow this up for you as well. He it says here in English, He answered them and said, Indeed, Elijah will come and will save all the world. I say to you, He has already come. They did not know Him, and they did to Him according to their desire. They will do, and so they will do to the Son of Man. And his disciples understand that regarding John the baptizer, he was saying this. Saying what? The part about they did to him according to their desire. But 
the Hebrew language is so clear. And that's what I really want you to be able to see. All right, and I'm hoping you guys can see this. Okay, Amanim is like, it is the word indeed. Uh, it also can be truly or in truth, which is be'emet in Hebrew. Uh, but Amanim is also like saying amen, but in the plural sense, which I find it fascinating. He says, Eliyah Yavo. Okay. Elijah, the Yod Bet Aleph, which is Bo, which means come. But Yavo or Yavo is the right way to pronounce that. Yavo means Elijah will come. Now, Elijah's already dead. But according to what Yeshua says, the Yomer Amenam Eliyahu Yavo Ve Yeshua Kol Haolam. That he's going to come and save all the world. In the Greek, restore all things. You know what's interesting though? When he shall come, what is he doing? He's also not just to save, but Ve Yeshua Kol Haolam. In other words, it's kind of like he restores back what Yeshua taught is really what it seems to imply, in my opinion. All right. And that's what's fascinating about the Hebrew Matthew. There is no question whatsoever. Eliyahu, Yavo, Elijah will come. You know, now he goes into the fact that he did come, but he will come. There's your Latter-day Rain message. See, the former, and what do we get in the latter, latter Rain? We get both former and Latter Rain. What is the former and Latter Rain? The former Rain is the teaching from the time of Moses, and the Latter Rain is the teaching of the time of Yeshua. The restoration, if you want to call it that, is what Moses did teach and what Yeshua taught without any question whatsoever, and Eliyahu is going to do that. You know, I just ran across one too. It's also in the Hebrew Matthew where he said they, ex they were expecting Moses to come. And I, I was just blown away. I'm like, I had no idea they were anticipating Moses to come, other than I know that Rashi, one of the sages, brought that out uh, in, in his writings, which Rashi says a lot of stuff that's kind of off the wall, but Rashi does say that Moses would have to be here during the Messianic Age from reading of Exodus chapter 15, where he says, Asherah Adonai Ga'ago Ve'rekevo Ve'bayom. You know, that, that uh, he says, I will sing unto the Lord because he has triumphed gloriously and he has thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. Not the 600 horses and their riders. So, at any rate, I'm blown away by this. Two witnesses have got to come. There's got to be a restoration. No, it's not Old and New Testament. Because, you know, and when it speaks about that the word of God will go forth, the truth of it will go forth from Jerusalem. Exactly. Why? We know this because Revelation says their dead bodies are going to lay in the street of that great city where our Lord was crucified. You think they're going to be up there cheerleading on the gay parades? No, sir. They're going to tell it like it is. Anyway, I haven't got into that subject in a long time. I trust it's a blessing to you. Listen, if this is what blesses you and you want to support what's truth, stand with us and support this ministry. You know, our address right here, bottom of your screen now. You can send your gifts to us here at the Noon Institute. Uh, it's better to put Danun Institute. You could put Israeli News Live if you want, but Danun Institute uh, is what we put on there. We need your help in getting the truth out. And my wife, she works tirelessly at research. Uh, so I guess she doesn't appear as much on camera here with me because she is like hours and hours and hours, day in and day out, nonstop, for one reason. She wants you to know what the truth is as well, just like I do. And the revelation she gets on the Word of God is phenomenal. Uh, and not to mention, many of you write to us revelations that you get as well. 
God is ready to work with people, but there is coming a restoration of his word. There is coming a true restoration. Yeah, that word, that word, the law, as they say, will go forth from Jerusalem. The restoration of what Moses said will come forth from Jerusalem, no doubt about it. I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. You can also visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And also, don't forget Patreon. We just loaded a new message over there on Patreon the other day. I hope it's a blessing to those of you that do watch it on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. I'll put that link down there in the description below for you. And uh, check out Yana's channel too, Rise Up Children of God. Uh, I'm hoping to start editing tonight. Uh, she did an interview uh, with uh, Sophia uh, uh, Smallstorm. And very interesting about glyphosate. And I think it's something that will bless you. There is some answers for people out there that are concerned about uh, how this dangerous pesticide has affected the human body. Uh, that'll probably air also here on Israeli News Live this coming Wednesday when we'll be traveling. So anyway, uh, Erev Tov. I'm Steve Benoon with Israeli News Live. Thank you for watching in the world of Angel and Peace.